warm greetings to all our viewers today. This is Angela Murjani, your presenter for this program. I have a request of all of you viewers today. I'm asking you that you will keep your minds very open to receive this interesting yet different poet that I'm going to talk to you about. I want you to reserve your opinions for when we've completed the whole program. John Donne, who lived from 1572 to 1631, was an English poet, satirist, preacher, and lawyer. His works include satires, sonnets, love poetry, religious poetry, and a whole volume of extraordinarily deep religious sermons. John Donne is believed to be the founder of the metaphysical school of poets. And this term gives us the impression, although quite wrongly, that his poems deal with the nature of the universe. The term, however, relates more to a style of writing than subject matter. In fact, it represents the reaction of a group of poets to their experiences in this universe. The term metaphysical was first applied to the works of John Donne by another very great and well-read poet called John Dryden. Later, the highly respected academician Dr. Samuel Johnson included a whole group of poets who had come under the influence of John Donne and called them the metaphysical school of poets. In doing so, Dr. Johnson was referring to a kind of poetic procedure and imagery that was introduced by John Donne and followed by many other poets after him. The metaphysicals looked for a link between their emotions and mental concepts. All their images arose from a perceived likeness between things which were apparently very different from one another. As a result, all metaphysical images are more logical than they are sensuous or emotional. Dunn set the metaphysical tone by writing poetry that was very opposed to the kind of themes that were popular in Elizabethan poetry. Firstly, he was opposed to the mellifluous and melodious strains of Elizabethan poetry. For Dunn, it was more important to use the jagged, rough rhythms of actual human speech. In fact, some of his poems have been organized as a heated argument in which he's arguing either with a reluctant mistress or with an intruding friend, with death, with God, and sometimes even with himself. The next thing that Dunn opposes in his poetry is the view of human life that was held by the Elizabethans in which they idealized human life and especially sexual love. Dunn's poetry is opposed to the kind of place that Petrarch and other Elizabethan sonnet writers gave to women. They exalted women to a position of great nobility as creatures who were honest, faithful and true. However, we find that in Dunn's poetry, human motives are highly suspect and Dunn is very cynical towards human attitudes. In fact, Dunn's work is full of wit, pun and paradox and the use of metaphors and images which are high on their shock value. The metaphysical conceit is a different kind of image and John Donne is considered to be the master of them. It is an extended metaphor in which a comparison is drawn between two things or situations which are apparently very different, but the poet is able to bring one point of commonality between the two and use it as an image. Therefore, you can see that John Donne and the metaphysical poets were looking more to logical thinking than emotions and senses in the construction of their imagery. Elizabethan poetry made use of very common images and these in time became commonplace and even cliched. 
For example, to describe love, they very often used the rose. But you won't find any such images in the metaphysical poets. They went to great lengths to bring extraordinary comparisons in order to make us use our minds much more than our emotions. One of the most famous examples of a metaphysical conceit is one that John Donne used in a poem called Valediction Forbidding Mourning. In this poem, John Donne compares two lovers who are separated to the arms of a compass. Now, who would ever think that a compass could be a symbol of love? Can you imagine that every day school children take in their compass boxes to school a symbol of love? Now, I promise you that at the end of this lesson, your perception of a compass would have changed forever. Now, one would not easily be able to see how a compass could be a symbol of love. But Dunn labors the point to where he explains that these two arms of the compass are like the two lovers. While one stays rooted to a spot, the other is able to go right around and accomplish his work and then come back to the original point of his relationship all the time being united at a certain point. So by using the compass as an extended metaphor or a metaphysical conceit, Dan is able to show us that when two people are truly in love, even if their work takes them far away, even if they are separated for long periods of time, there remains a point of contact, there remains that connection, and that is the connection of love between these two separated lovers. You can see from this that the images used by the metaphysical poets are intellectual and logical rather than emotional and sensuous. And this is a trait of the metaphysical school of poets that their images require the application of a thought process and the application of logic in order that we can understand how this can be an image for an emotion. These conceits have been found to be interesting strange and even at times outrageous. Some critics have found the metaphysical conceits very funny and have therefore given them the name metaphysical humor. John Donne's poem Go and Catch a Falling Star is found in his collection of poems called Songs and Sonnets. In this case, the entire poem is one big conceit which states that it is impossible to find a faithful woman who is both beautiful and virtuous. This poem belongs to the earlier days of John Donne's writing of poetry when he used metaphysical conceits humorously to express his cynicism against female sexuality. In the early days of his career, before John Donne became famous as an Anglican theological doctorate holder who wrote wonderful sermons, he wrote poems for the men who hung out at taverns and pubs. Some critics have said that this poem was probably written for these men to sing when they were out of luck with the ladies. Another view holds that probably in the young days of John Donne, when he had a reputation as having gone out with many women, this poem must have been the result of his betrayal at the hands of some woman. And when he felt this stinging betrayal and rejection, John Donne penned these words in the poem, Go and Catch a Falling Star, which represent the stereotypical view of woman as femme fatale. Women who are reading this poem must not take offense at John Donne's opinion, but instead permit him to vent his feelings as one who has been deeply wounded by a member of the opposite sex and give him credit that he expresses his revenge through a poem that is so witty, humorous, funny and smart at the same time. We've talked a lot about this poem. Now, Let's read it and find out what he actually has to say. Song, 
Go and Catch a Falling Star by John Dunn. Go and catch a falling star. Get with child a mandrake root. Tell me where all past years are or who cleft the devil's foot. Teach me to hear mermaids singing or to keep off envy's stinging and find what wind serves to advance an honest mind. If thou beest born to strange sights, things invisible to see, ride 10,000 days and nights till age snow white hairs on thee. Thou, when thou returnest, will tell me all strange wonders that befell thee and swear nowhere lives a woman true and fair. If thou findest one, let me know. Such a pilgrimage was sweet. Yet do not, I would not go, though at next door we might meet, though she were true when you met her, and last till you write your letter, yet she will be false ere I come to two or three. The poem begins with an imperative, a command, go and catch a falling star. The shock value of this opening comes from the rough rhythms, the jagged rhythms of direct speech as the poet addresses somebody who's there with him, whom we would call an interlocutor. This is typical of the metaphysical poets. It's also typical of John Donne to introduce his key note, his punchline right in the very first line of his poem, which he does in this poem, Go and Catch a Falling Star. The speaker addresses an unknown interlocutor to whom he assigns seven impossible tasks. Amongst them, go and catch a falling star and get a mandrake root pregnant with a child. None of these tasks is going to be possible for the person to accomplish. Many people, even in this day and age, believe that if they could wish upon a falling star, then their wish would be granted. Of course, this is just a myth or a legend, because a falling star is nothing but cosmic debris or dust igniting as it enters into the Earth's atmosphere. However, the poet chooses to believe in this superstition, and he tells the interlocutor to go and not only find him a falling star upon which he could wish, but to actually capture it, to catch it and bring it to him. And this is an expression of the poet's desperate desire to fulfill that one wish which he has, which is to find a woman both beautiful and true. The mandrake is a European herb which has a forked root that resembles the legs of a man. This mandrake root has been the subject of innumerable superstitions and has been believed to be used by black magicians from time immemorial. Here, Dunn uses it primarily for its connection with its resemblance to a man and particularly his legs. But there are two impossibilities here. Firstly, it is impossible to achieve oneness with a vegetable root. Secondly, this root resembled the legs of a man. And further, the poet asked the interlocutor to get that root to bear a child. Now, all of these are impossible situations. And the poet is again once more comparing such a situation to finding the ideal woman that he is looking for. Similarly impossible are the poet's demands of the interlocutor that he be able to tell him where time has gone or who has split the hoof of the devil or help him to be able to hear the voice of mermaids singing. It has constantly remained a puzzle to man, however wise or intelligent he might be, what becomes of time. You will constantly hear people wondering what happened to the time? You will often hear people say, where has this day gone? Or worse still, where did this month disappear or this year? 
it is so common for us to read in the papers on the 31st of every December. People who are journalists, important people, just about everybody wondering where has the year gone. Now time has a way of slipping past and it is impossible for anyone to say where time has gone. The question which the poet asks the interlocutor is to find out where is the past hidden. And we all know that this is an impossible assignment, as impossible as catching a falling star. Similarly, ancient Christian theologists believed that the feet of the devil were split or cloven, somewhat like the feet of certain animals, like the pig, the goat, and many others. Now, these theologists all believed that likewise, the feet of the devil were also divided. But where this belief came from or who started it is not known. And therefore, the poet tells the interlocutor to go and find out where did this conception of the devil's feet start from? Who started this idea in the first place? In the same way, Dunn likens the finding of a beautiful woman who is also faithful to the difficulty of being able to hear a mermaid sing. Now, in classical literature, we have the representation of these fabulous, beautiful creatures called mermaids that were half woman and half fish. According to classical mythology, they sat on the rocks and lured men by their lilting songs. And whenever they were able to ensnare those men, they then destroyed them. Although there have been many reports of mermaid sightings, there has never actually been any documented proof that these mythological characters do indeed exist. Therefore, Inciting them as an example for the possibility of finding his perfect or ideal woman, what Dunn is saying is that just as mermaids must remain mythological characters, so also his perfect ideal woman will remain a myth. In another sarcastic and cynical note, the poet suggests that it's going to be as impossible for him to be free from the sting of envy as finding this awesome woman that he is looking for. Now, envy has been described as an emotion wherein a person wants to have something, either a quality or a commodity, which he thinks that he doesn't have, but somebody else has and he desires to have it. In this particular line, the poet is saying that as impossible as it has been for him to rid himself of this horrible feeling of envy, so also it's going to be impossible for him to find his ideal woman. The same is true for the source or the place from where honesty can get its reward. The poet seems to suggest that honest people never get a reward in life and when we look around us, we see only the dishonest doing well. It's so true of us even today, living in 21st century India, when we look around, we see that dishonest people are prospering everywhere. But it seems on the other hand, like there is no reward or even recognition for the honest. Look around you, who are those who are prospering? The dishonest, the thieves, the scamsters, the crooks, the polished and the crude ones, everywhere things have not changed very much. Whether you consider it in 16th or 17th century or 20th or 21st century, England or India, it is just the same. It seems like there is no reward for the honest. The poet's attitude is one of extreme cynicism and when we consider his life, we can easily understand why. In spite of being a prolific writer who wrote and whose poems were circulated widely even during his own lifetime, we find that Dunn and his wife Anne Moore and their many children often found themselves in a situation of abject 
poverty. Depending upon donations from friends and support from people who appreciated his poetry, their life was extremely difficult. So one can easily understand in the context of his own poverty why John Donne felt this way about honesty. The references to Mandrake and to the mermaids in this stanza are both very significant. As both of these have mythical implications, it seems to be the poet's desire to imply likewise that his search for the perfect or ideal woman is going to be a mythical journey. And such journeys have a happy ending only in myth or in legend. Real life can prove to be quite different. In the second stanza, the poet is talking to a person whom he is sending out on a journey to seek this perfect or ideal woman for him. He tells this man that if he were gifted with extraordinary vision, if he could see what normal men cannot see, if he could see the invisible and he were to go on a journey of a thousand days and a thousand nights, then he would come back and have some amazing things to report. He would be able to see some fantastic things on his long journey. Dunn imagines that this man who has gone out on the journey would spend an entire lifetime on seeking out this woman. In fact, his hair, which would have been colored at the start of his journey, would turn completely grey at the end of it. And he would come back to report that he had seen such things which no human eye had seen, such sights which were invisible to normal people. However, he would have to report that nowhere in his travels has he seen the kind of woman that John Dunn is searching for, that beautiful woman who is both faithful and true. Now one would have to take the testimony of such a man because he was able to see both what normal men could see as well as he had the gift of vision to see what ordinary people couldn't. And therefore, one would be compelled to take as true the report of this man whom Dunn was sending on a journey of a thousand days and thousand nights. The third stanza begins on a note of rising hope. If thou findest her, let me know, the poet says to the interlocutor. What he's saying to this man, this hope is however soon dashed to the ground in a thousand pieces. The poet says to the seeker, if when you go out and you actually do find a woman who is so beautiful as well as so pure and so true, then let me know because I want to make a pilgrimage to her. Now the poet calls such a trip a pilgrimage because he feels that at the end of a journey, if he were to see such an awesome woman, someone who was so virtuous, then his trip would take on the solemnity of a sacred journey. And that's why he calls it a pilgrimage. But alas, as I said, those hopes are soon dashed to the ground because the poet says that in as much time as it would take for the interlocutor to send him a letter, and even if that woman were his neighbor living right next door to him, in that much of time when the poet set out to go and meet her, she would be unfaithful. At least, he says, to one or two or even three men. This takes us back to the mermaids of stanza one, those creatures who lured men only to destroy them. And the poet's implication here seems to be that even if one follows the fantasy, even one, if one goes after the dream, it could very well lead to destruction as the woman would turn out to be not all that the poet had expected her to be. Now, when it comes to John Donne's poem, Song, Go and Catch a Falling Star, there is a whole other set of critics who feel very differently about this poem. And I think it's fair to share this view with you because I had a professor in university, 
a very renowned man named Dr. Isaac Sequeira. And he used to tell us of all the criticism that had been written on Shakespeare. Things like a psychoanalytical approach to Shakespeare, a communist reading of Shakespeare. And he would say that it was unlikely that Shakespeare himself would have seen all these interpretations to his own work. Therefore, it seems fair that once a poet has written and published his work, it is open to the world of interpretation. And you viewers can also read this, read this poem and give your own interpretation of it. The poem may thus be seen as a very broad and general statement about women, about her mysterious and ever-changing emotions. And in seeing a woman as such, Dunn is placing her right up there with all the other unsolvable mysteries of this universe. Some critics have seen Dunn's poem as a very legitimate expression of his desire to find a woman who is both beautiful and virtuous as a lifetime companion for himself. Even if finding such a woman were to be as difficult as catching a falling star or uh, getting a mandrake to have a child, whatever the difficulty, John Dunn sees such an exercise as worthwhile because he is looking for a lifetime partner, a soulmate with whom he could spend the rest of his life. It is said that in marrying Anne Moore, to whom he was happily married and faithful for as long as she lived, John Dunn did indeed find just such a companion. The second stanza seems to increase the ambit of the poet's search by talking about huge ranges of space and mind that the poet is willing to traverse, to travel, in order to find this choice woman whom he has set apart as the ideal that he wants to share his life with. In the last stanza, it seems like the poet goes back for recourse to the mythical figure of the mermaids to say that such a woman is indeed impossible to find and must forever remain a fantasy in the back of a man's mind. I hope you've enjoyed this rendition of John Dunn's poem, Song, Go and Catch a Falling Star, in which he explains this amazing metaphysical conceit of how difficult it is to find a woman who is both beautiful and of good sound character. Women, I hope you will not be too annoyed with him, but will understand that having been betrayed by a woman, it was just natural for John Dunn to feel anger and bitterness with the whole opposite sex. Forgive him and understand his view of human life and enjoy the poem for what it's worth.